Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm reacting to Finding God Without Faith, a personal reflection based on Advaita Vedanta. So this is Swami Tatmananda's video. And um, I don't know, I just, the word God is such a, a very tainted word. I, I shouldn't say tainted, but it's a very strong meaning in Western culture or Western society in general. And it's very specific, obviously. <laughs> But I guess there's an interesting discussion I had with a coworker, but perhaps I'll save it until the end or somewhere in the middle if it happens to creep up and if I don't forget. But to say find God without fate, can I say find existence without fate? That seems a bit weird to say, but anyways, let's get started. <laughs> This topic, finding God without faith, is very personal for me. I was raised in a Roman Catholic family, and I went to Mass every Sunday. As a child, I attended a Catholic grade school where we were taught by nuns dressed in flowing black habits. Inside the towering church during Mass, I was fascinated by the ornate altar where priests conducted a mysterious ritual that transformed ordinary bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The notes of the church organ vibrated deep inside me, and the melancholy chanting of Latin prayers sometimes moved me to tears. As a child, I was quite devout. I even fantasized about growing up to become a priest. Um, I will say I was kind of roughly the same way, not, not to grow up as a priest, though. I, I wouldn't say I was devout, I suppose, but I did go to church. Um, because my grandfather on my, my mother's side was, I believe, a priest. I think I went one time to church with him. I can't remember if it was a priest. I think it was, but I'm not too sure. Maybe he s volunteered, maybe. I'm not sure. It's a long, long time ago when I was very young. And, uh, yeah, I believed, uh, I, I believed, mind you, I was, let's say, uh, I'm trying to think, under nine years old, so between six and eight. <laughs> um... Between six and eight, when you know, I really believed, I prayed, and what kind of got me questioning is, I prayed every time that I would pass school, and every time I graduated, uh, every time I go up a grade level, I did pass. I decided one day maybe I don't pray. Let's just see how well I do on my own, and I pass. I'm like, okay. Um, then I stopped praying. But I still believed. Maybe, you know, to you to pray, to do all all that kind of thing for protection. You know, bats, you know, believe in vampires or our particular version of um of vampires and, you know, creatures and stuff at the night. Um yeah, and I used that and then just had my beliefs kinda of just started waning a bit. But yes, anyways, roughly the same, kind of, but not as devout as he was. But before long, I felt deeply troubled about my faith. Our school curriculum included a daily religion class in which we had to memorize and recite the official catechism of the church. We used a small book like this one, and it began... Who made us? God made us. Who is God? God is the supreme being, infinitely perfect, who made all things and keeps them in existence. Why did God make us? 
God made us to show his goodness and to make us happy with him in heaven. How can we gain the happiness of heaven? To gain the happiness of heaven, we must know God, we must love God, and we must serve God. Several times I raised my hand in class to ask questions, like, would my Protestant and Jewish friends also be able to go to heaven? The nun scowled at me and said I shouldn't ask such questions because these teachings simply have to be believed. They have to be completely accepted <coughs> without doubt. I wondered back then, why did God give us powerful intellects if we were not supposed to use those intellects in religion class? <laughs> well, being scolded by the nun was the beginning of the end for me. For me, I don't think my family was very religious. Kind of had just the religion vibe, I suppose. You know, go to we did go to church a few times, <clears throat> but like maybe five to ten times in in my life then, before I was nine, around again sixty-eight, if I can remember. But yeah, I mean, I mean, me not praying that one time, I stopped praying to pass my class. <laughs> I feel like I was cheating, um, and then. And then uh, just using kind of like, you know, asking God to protect me from the demons. <laughs> I remember those days. And then what else? I don't know. As I got older, after nine years old, I just wasn't really, I wasn't really seeing any demons or monsters or anything like that. And I just never really did anything since and never really thought about my faith at the time. I don't think it was my faith was ever in trouble or or an eth or or trouble I suppose would be the right question but it was in question I suppose or maybe maybe it wasn't really in question it's probably more along the lines that it was just slowly faded and then I saw as as we looked into I guess maybe YouTube or maybe science class I, or maybe reasoning, just thinking about things, questioning things, like why would God create evil? Why would why would God put us through Earth just to bring us back to heaven to make us happy for for, for good obedient people? Um, why would uh, God hide? Why would why would God plant the tree in the Garden of Eden? knowing that Eve would bite it and then Adam would bite it afterwards. I mean, clearly God is all-knowing, so he would knew that before he even created Earth. God knew that Adam and Eve would eat or bite the apple that he forbid them to eat. So all this was planned out already. I was like, all this question is like, like, you know, it doesn't sound like a right kind of God. So I was like, well, I just don't believe anymore. And... I figured if there is a God out there, that I, I would assume he'd appreciate the fact that I don't just believe for the sake of believing and, you know, take you as you are. Uh, you seek the truth as best you can, and he'll appreciate you for doing that, not just merely believing so that you don't go to hell. <laughs> Even as a child, I disliked the dogmatism of the church even though I didn't know then what the word dogmatism meant. I quickly became disenchanted with the church, and by the time I was a teenager, I had developed an allergy to religion, so to speak. <laughs> Later, when I was still in my 20s, I felt something missing in my life, and that led me to undertake a spiritual quest. I started by reading books on Western philosophy, but I soon shifted to what we called Eastern philosophy, Taoism, Buddhism, and of course, 
Hinduism. I was really impressed by the works of Swami Vivekananda, the brilliant disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. That's how I got introduced to Advaita Vedanta. I started to attend classes taught by <coughs> monks from the Ramakrishna mission. Okay, so he talked about his introduction. Let me go ahead and talk about mine real quick. Sorry if this is not what you intended, but my introduction was in college. I thought, you know, I kind of want to know what other religions are out there. Not because I want to uh, become religious or be pick up a religion, but more along the lines of just to see the cure, just to understand what each religion is about, just because, <clears throat> so I can counter them, <laughs> but to understand it also. And Buddhism really, really uh, picked up. I, as a matter of fact, um, Advaita Vedanta, the, I guess all that was kind of grouped up in Hinduism. So it was not separate from that, and we didn't really delve too much into it. But Buddhism really struck me. Again, because of the few words that life is suffering. And the thing that I thought about there is like, life is suffering. Childbirth is not suffering. Wait, there's a lot of pain that's involved in that. But they're usually happy, but still pain, suffering. It's like, hmm, never mind. And it's like, what else? Um, in order to get happiness, you know, you have to suffer. You have to put in work to become happy. That's what I thought of back then. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, yeah, you know, in order to become a millionaire, a lot of people put in a lot of hard work and sacrifice, uh, gave up some of their social life and, you know, their family life to become so successful. That's, a, that's suffering. I was like, maybe there is something to this. It's kind of crazy. The next thing was a little bit smaller part. It's just that, you know, give it 110%, give it everything you've got, but expect nothing from the result. I'm like, so why, why would you not expect anything from the result? I mean, you put in a lot of effort there, you know, you, you took out time from not having fun to doing this work. Why don't you want an A? And, but I thought about it, it's like, you know, if you don't expect anything, but, but, but there was a finishing part. It's like, if it comes out great, that's good. But if it comes out bad, well, you didn't expect anything at all. It's like, I thought about that. It's like, hmm. So do the best you can, but don't expect anything from it. So that if it turns out bad, well, you're not going to suffer for it because you weren't expecting anything from it. But if it turns out good, that's great. You don't have to be prideful or anything from it, but it's good that it did. But again, expect nothing from it so you don't suffer the consequences of the work that you put in. That's like, it really made me think. And then I started this channel, and I, I can't remember someone, I don't know who it is, I'm not sure who's the first person to suggest, you know, reacting to, I don't know if it's Sad Guru or Swami Sarvapriyananda as the first Eastern philosophy, but that's how it kind of started. This is where I'm at now today. Then, in 1981, I happened to attend a lecture by Swami Dayananda a lecture that affected me very deeply. Swami Dayananda said, God is not a matter of belief. God is a reality to be known, a truth to be discovered. Hearing those words transformed my thinking. And as you might already know, Swami Dayananda would soon become my guru. And the words, Life is suffering transformed my way of thinking as well. Instead of using the word God, Swami Dayananda generally used the Sanskrit word Ishvara. Ishvara. I later learned that he did this to avoid <coughs> the enormous confusion associated with the word God. Mm -hmm. Most people agree that the word God refers to the one supreme being who created the universe. Yet, for Christians, God exists as three divine persons. God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit that dwells within. Three persons that are said to be one in essence. For Jews, on the other hand, God is Yahweh the historical God of Abraham, who gave the Ten Commandments to Moses 
and delivered the Israelites from slavery. But Muslims declare there is no God other than Allah, the All-Merciful and All-Powerful, whose prophet is Muhammad. Unlike the followers of those three Western religions, most Buddhists and Jains deny the existence of an almighty supreme being who created the universe. It's really weird to say that a Muslim is Western. Is, is the Middle East considered to be part of the Western? 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 <laughs> Where does this Western and Eastern come from? Is, is it from the... Uh, was it the uh, International Dateline, I suppose? East, West, no, I don't know. Anyways, I, I, I would have never thought Islam to be a Western thing. I thought that would be more Middle Eastern, I suppose, but I, that's why I say Abrahamic religion, because that, I assume that means a time frame within, you know, because obviously the Christians or Catholic warring with the Muslims in the past and those religions are about maybe the same time they started I guess that's the reason why I call it the Abrahamic religion because it all started roughly around that time I would have never thought Islam to be a Western religion though and for Hindus well it's a whole lot more complicated the Hindu tradition accepts many individual gods and goddesses yet all of them are considered to be forms of Ishvara. In the Rig Veda, the most ancient Hindu scripture, there's a famous but often mistranslated verse that says, Ekam sat viprabahu dhavaranti. Ishvara is one, who the wise describe in many ways. Even though Ishvara is one, Hindu scriptures describe Ishvara very differently than the one supreme being worshipped by Christians, Jews, and Muslims. You might be surprised to know that a remarkably precise definition of Ishvara can be found in many Vedantic works. This definition is incredibly helpful because so much confusion arises when we use words like God or soul or divinity without clearly defining what those terms mean. And spiritual and spirituality as well, mind you. But yes, that it, it's, it, it is obviously in terms of the Western culture, God, soul, divinity, spirit, spiritual, it has a very, very strong definition because the strongest religion, I suppose you could say, is Christian or Catholic in the Western culture. So when you think of God, it's always associated with those two religions. And I'm sure if you go to an uh, Islamic nation, if you say God, obviously they're going to be thinking of their particular version of God. I don't know if they have soul or divinity included in their, in their um, scriptures or not, but I'm sure there is equivalency of it. So a clear precise definition of Ishvara is crucial, and that's what we'll discuss next. Before we continue, please note that Ishvara is not a hymn, like God the Father or like Yahweh of the Jews. But grammatically, the Sanskrit word Ishvara happens to be masculine in gender. For this reason, masculine pronouns are used when referring to Ishvara. The precise definition I mentioned before is this. Abhinna nimitta upadana karana, the efficient and material cause for the universe that is non-separate from it. 
This definition might be precise, but it's much too terse and scholarly to be understood without some help. <coughs> Let's try to unpack those words. First of all, material cause and efficient cause are philosophical terms used to describe the two main factors necessary for any act of creation. To make a pot like this, the material cause is clay. That simply means clay is the material needed to make this pot. But in addition to clay, a pot maker is also required. The potter is the efficient cause, the maker, the intelligent agent needed to make a pot. To make a table like this, wood is the material cause, and a carpenter is the efficient cause. Obviously, nothing can be created without a suitable material or without a skillful maker. Now, look at this. Potter and clay are two separate factors needed to make a pot. Carpenter and wood are two separate factors needed to make a table. This guy is amazing at explaining stuff. For me, it is so easy. I do wonder, is this explanation like spot on or is there some questions? I'm kind of curious because for me, it's like, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> I believe in every video, he's always been so good at explaining. In both cases, the two factors, the maker and the material, are different from each other. But the definition of Ishwara we're discussing describes him as being both the maker and the material, both the efficient and the material cause for the universe. To make a pot, a potter can dig clay from the ground. But to create the universe, Ishvara can't go to some kind of celestial storehouse for raw materials. Before the universe was created, Ishvara alone existed, nothing else. There was no external source of material. Logically speaking, Ishvara himself has to be the material cause for the universe, as well as its efficient cause. How can that be? It's explained by a famous metaphor found in the Mundaka Upanishad, a Vedic scripture that says the universe is like a spider's web. Yatha urna na bihi srijate grinate cha. The universe is like a web that's spun by a spider and later gets consumed by the spider. That's an absolutely brilliant metaphor. Obviously, the spider is the efficient cause, the maker of the web. In spite of its extremely tiny brain, the spider has all the knowledge and power it needs to make a web. In the same way, Ishvara is said to possess all the knowledge and power needed to create the universe. That means Ishvara possesses infinite knowledge and limitless power. With that knowledge and power, Ishvara can create an incredibly complex universe, a universe that <clears throat> functions in a perfectly orderly manner. Ishvara's intelligent order ensures that planets continue to orbit their suns and electrons continue to orbit their nuclei. Ishvara's intelligent order also ensures that you receive the results of deeds you've committed in this life and in past lives. Now, let's return to the spider metaphor. For a web, the spider is not only the efficient cause, it's hard to pause right in the middle of the explanation, but he just made me think of something about rebirth. <coughs> he said that 
you get your do you get your d you get your anyway you you get what your you get what's coming to you throughout your entire rebirths now this is an interesting thought i don't know if i don't know if this is what a rebirth is meant but i have a feeling it it's rebirth in this in the same cycle so the thing i thought of is I think Sadhguru said 84, right? So, and I was saying that the universe probably has been destroyed and created many times before. What if this? We are reborn. However, we are only ever reborn in a universe one time. Until the universe is destroyed, you are not reborn then once the universe is recreated you are reborn into that new universe and then once you die in that new universe you won't be reborn again until that universe is destroyed and then a new universe is recreated and then you are born into that universe that would be interesting although it does I mean some of the rebirths don't say it that way they say it's within this this lifetime I suppose or within the next lifetime and also the some of the things that I've seen on YouTube videos about people remembering a past that they clearly didn't know about so and it's they can point out a certain thing and they go to that spot and that thing is there so that would kind of disprove my rebirth to a degree but I wonder if it's anyone said that you, you do get reborn, but not in this particular universe, because you've already been born once here, and you only have one life in this universe. And once this universe is destroyed, and then a new universe is created in its place, you are then reborn into that universe. I just a thought out there. Um, is there anything that says anything like that? Has anyone thought about it that being it that way? Let me know. The maker, but it's the material cause as well. The spider weaves a web from silky threads produced by its own body. A potter needs clay, but a spider already has the necessary material within itself. In a similar way, Ishra himself is said to be the source of the fundamental stuff out of which the universe is woven. Ishvara manifests the universe from himself without needing any kind of external material. In this way, Ishvara is both maker and material. Also, when a web gets damaged, the spider who made it will eat the threads and recycle the material to use in making another web. That nicely represents how Ishvara is said to withdraw the universe into himself at the end of a cycle of creation, before making the universe manifest once again in the next cycle. Okay, the spider metaphor is really helpful, but we're not done yet. Our definition of Ishvara describes him as being abhinna, non-separate, that is, non-separate from his creation, from the universe. A spider is obviously separate from its web. A spider can even abandon its web. But Ishvara can never abandon the universe. Why? Because according to the definition, Ishvara is utterly non-separate from the universe, as we'll discuss in just a moment. The spider metaphor is not perfect. As you know, all metaphors have limitations. Metaphors are tools we use to understand things. After hammering in a nail, if you need to tighten a screw, you'll grab a screwdriver. In the same way, after using the spider metaphor, we can use another one, a metaphor found in the scriptures that compares the universe to the dream world that you create each night while you sleep. 
Oh man, I had something really good. Crap. I forgot it. Oh well. <laughs> when you sleep, a dream world arises in your mind. A world filled with people, clouds, trees, animals, and so on. Then, when you wake up, that dream world fades away. It returns to its source. It returns to you, its creator. For that dream world, you are its creator, its sustainer, and its destroyer. Just like Ishvara, in the form of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, is said to be the creator, sustainer, and destroyer of the universe. More than that, to create a dream world, you are both the maker and the material, the efficient and the material cause. As the efficient cause, you possess all the knowledge and power needed to create the dream world. It's created from your memories and imagination. And further, it is you who determines the laws of nature that govern your dream world. You are the source of its intelligent order. That's why you can fly in your dreams and fall great distances without getting hurt. In the same way, Ishvara is said to determine the laws that govern this universe. Ishvara himself is the source of the intelligent order that regulates the world. For your dream world, not only are you its maker, the efficient cause, but you are its material cause as well. The trees and houses in your dreams are not made of wood, nor are the people in your dreams made of flesh and bones. What are they made of? They're made of you, of your own mind stuff, so to speak. <laughs> mind stuff. In the same way, everything in the universe is said to be a manifestation of Ishvara. The universe is therefore made of Ishvara. The Chandogya Upanishad says quite boldly, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. All this, the entire cosmos, is nothing but Brahman, nothing but Ishvara. My own guru often reiterated this teaching. He said, the truth is not that there is one God, but rather that there is only God. <laughs> wow, what an amazing teaching. Okay, we've just finished describing Ishvara with the help of a precise scholarly definition. We also used a series of metaphors to better understand the source and creator of the universe. In that whole discussion, what were you asked to believe? Nothing. Nothing at all. That's what I find so remarkable about Advaita Vedanta. Its teachings make extensive use of reason to present Ishvara as a reality to be understood, a truth to be discovered, a supreme being who can actually be known and not remain merely as a matter of belief. I guess my only issue is the fact that, again, still God is so well defined. And when you say God, it's assumed to be talking about their God, whatever religions you happen to say God to. <laughs> and this goes back to, I was going to pause it a little bit earlier, but I figured I'd let it finish, to what I said earlier about existence. Like, I can believe existence, and essentially... Ishvara and uh, existence are, in, in, from what I can understand, is about one and the same. Um, there would be no universe, no nothing, no you and me without existence. Existence, and well, without Ishvara, the, I probably pronounce yeah, Ishvara, Ishvara, 
uh, without Ishvara, there, good lord, Ishvara, there'd be no existence. So, existence and saying Ishvara are seemingly one and the same to me. But the biggest issue is the fact that Ishvara is a name given to something with masculine, I won't say masculine features, but has a, uh, what is it, um, a masculine word, I suppose. So you say he and whatnot. Whereas existence itself, it's not, it's neither one. It's not uh, a, a something, because whenever something has a name, generally it's an object. Existence is not an object. It's not a singularity object. It is everything. <laughs> so to say, ex to believe in existence is one thing, which is easy to believe. But to say to believe in Ishvara, even though I believe people who understand Ishvara uh, differently from God and me saying existence probably may seem the same things. Like there's just Ishvara existence are the same, perhaps. I'm not sure. But that's my assumption. Because obviously without Ishvara, none of this exists. For me, without existence, there'd be no existence. <laughs> but just the fact that because there's a name to it, like Yahweh, God, um, Allah, <laughs> um, Buddha, and whatever other gods are out there, um, Thor, Zeus, Ra, Jupiter, yeah, anyways, you know, they're, they're names given, and I guess that's kind of, again, hard to use that a, a name word for something because it then is given up to like oh there's another religion here's the name of this god you know kind of deal so existence for me is a little bit better but it's again that's, I think the reason why I said in a very oh I believe in existence well obviously <laughs> it's really weird to say existence as something that you believe because it's kind of like yeah of course <laughs> Now, in the final part of this presentation, let's consider some possible shortcomings in Vedanta's highly rational approach to Ishvara that rejects belief. When you think about it, Vedanta's logic and reason don't seem very helpful if you want to cultivate intense emotions of love and reverence for Ishvara. The precise definition we've discussed doesn't seem to directly lead to a practice of heartfelt prayer, veneration, and worship. After all, no one prays to a material and efficient cause. <laughs> we pray to an all-powerful and all-knowing Supreme Being. Most Hindu traditions that emphasize devotion, bhakti, are not based on scholarly Vedantic teachings. Instead, they're based on devotional teachings associated with mythological stories, stories about forms of Ishvara like Krishna, Shiva, Vishnu, and Ganesha. Most of those stories are found in the Puranas, where gods and goddesses are elaborately portrayed together with their divine attributes their supernatural deeds, and their extraordinary blessings bestowed on sincere devotees. Those Puranic stories can certainly inspire intense devotional feelings, especially in Hindus who grew up listening to such stories. But for many, including spiritual seekers like me who were not raised in Hindu families, those stories often fail to provide a strong foundation for devotional practices. So we can ask, is it possible to develop intense feelings of devotion to Ishvara without believing in those stories of gods and goddesses? 
Is it possible to develop devotion through spiritual knowledge alone? Absolutely. In the Bhagavad Gita and elsewhere, knowledge of Ishvara is extolled as a powerful means for cultivating devotion. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says quite plainly, the wise realize my divine nature and worship me with devoted hearts. After gaining knowledge of me as the imperishable source of all beings, but how can mere knowledge of Ishvara possibly lead to intense emotions of love and reverence? Well, consider this. In India, many couples are wedded as a result of arranged marriages. For this reason, it's not unusual for newly married couples to hardly know each other. But over a period of time, they come to know each other better and better. And as that knowledge grows deeper, their feelings of love and intimacy also grow deeper. This example suggests that as your knowledge of Ishvara grows deeper and deeper, you can indeed cultivate intense emotions of love and reverence. That was certainly my experience. As a young man who was allergic to religion, I wasn't inclined to believe anything whatsoever. Not surprisingly, when I began to study Advaita Vedanta, the mythological stories in the Puranas didn't attract me at all. Back then, I admitted to a fellow student, I don't have a devotional bone in my body. Yet, over a period of years, I gradually developed a rich and meaningful prayer life. For decades now, most of my mornings begin with prayer, puja, and meditation on Ishvara. But how could heartfelt bhakti like that take root in a hyper-rational non-believer like me? Well, studying Sri Krishna's teachings in the Bhagavad Gita has probably helped me more than anything else. Other Vedantic teachings have also helped a lot, like the dream metaphor we discussed before. With the help of all those teachings, I've gradually come to feel that the world around me <clears throat> is truly a divine manifestation of Ishvara. Everything I see, hear, taste, smell, and touch seems to be endowed with divinity. When I go for a walk on the beautiful trails behind our ashram, I feel like I'm walking through Ishvara, as if I'm surrounded by Ishvara or embraced by him, so to speak. My own body and mind also seem like divine manifestations of Ishvara. With age, they take on a unique kind of beauty, like a favorite old book that you still treasure <laughs> in spite of all its loose pages and its broken binding. When I teach a class or work on producing a video like this one, I feel so grateful for the skills and intelligence that Ishvara has given me. When I start a new project, I know that the outcome of my efforts will be determined by Ishvara, according to his intelligent order that governs the universe. During morning puja, the deities on my little altar connect me to a divinity that's immeasurably vast and infinitely powerful. I need to see if he has a video on his daily routine, or at the very least, like, certain routines. I'm kind of curious as to uh, what he does, why he does it, and the meaning behind it. Very specifically, just, like, what he does in particular, because he claims to be um, essentially non-devotional. So what makes him do this? I mean, clearly he's explaining it here, but like what made him want to do this? This is very much a devotional thing. So... 
Because in my mind, it's a, uh, I don't know how to explain this. I will think about it a little bit for that for that explanation, but I guess I just perhaps maybe him explaining these uh, rituals that he do that he does may help me better understand why he does it. And when I close my eyes for prayer or meditation, I can sense that beyond the manifestation of Ishra that surrounds me and sustains me, there is an even greater reality, a reality that transcends the universe, like a dreamer transcends his dream world. Now, I have to admit that I don't always feel such a profound sense of being intimately connected to Ishwara. Each day, there are many times when I get distracted or absorbed in mundane matters, and I temporarily lose that sense of Ishwara's divine presence. After all, I'm a normal human being, not a great saint. But that profound sense of intimacy is always accessible. It's always available. It only takes a moment of prayerful reflection. Ishwara is never more than one thought away. I've just shared some very personal observations about myself. My intention here is not to demonstrate any kind of spiritual accomplishment, but rather to make a particular point. And the point is, if someone as unlikely as me can develop a rich and meaningful prayer life with the help of Vedanta's teachings, then anyone can. Such is the power of these teachings. Okay, so this is okay. I guess the thing, the story that I was saying about earlier about the the conversation I had with a coworker of mine, which happened about a week or two ago, is a very interesting conversation. I will explain it in the way that it was said. So I don't know what came up, but um, something along the lines of. <sighs> Anyways, the I can't remember what brought it up, but he said that the world is all, everything is subjective. He doesn't know that anything is real. And I said, no, there's at least one objective truth. There's at least one objective truth. There has to be one objective truth. And essentially he said no no everything is subjective we don't even know if this reality is real we don't know if you or me are real I said no even if me and you are, is fake this world is fake there's still one objective truth because in order for this world this fake world and this fake us to exist there must be a reality behind it I wasn't even trying to I wasn't even trying to sound like Brahmin or anything like that it's, it's merely the matrix kind of deal so, for example, the thing I was thinking of was even, let's say, this entire world and all of us in it is a computer simulation. Just to see, just say, to see if this world can work, this iteration of the world can work. This is the 84th iteration of this world running through the simulation to see if this, this particular algorithm works. The, re the underlying reality is the computer running this um, software, this, this Maya, and Brahma, Brahman being um, the computer. That underlying reality that's running the software that we're seeing all here now is the underlying objective truth. Because without that computer, this does not exist. Now I'm not I'm not gonna go further back from the computer like oh aliens running the computer with the power supply no just merely the fact that the underlying truth is the computer running uh, a program that's generating this world the computer being Brahman the com the the world that we see today and how we're all here is the Maya <clears throat> and their underlying consciousness or Brahman the existence truth is the computer that was just kind of the example. I wasn't even really thinking about it like that, honestly. I was just thinking about it like something has to create this 
falseness for it to be real, uh, for it to exist. This falseness can only exist if there's an underlying truth, reality. <clears throat> Essentially, that's the, that's the thing I was trying to get at. And he's saying, no, 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 no. This all is, is all subjective. And I was like, no, no, no. Because without an underlying truth, underlying reality, nothing would exist. Without, and I, I try to explain it, without existence, there'll be nothing. So therefore, existence is the underlying truth, the underlying reality, the objective truth, because it must exist for anything to have, for anything to exist, whether it be truth or false, fake, you know, illusions. There must be an underlying truth for anything else to exist, underlying existence for anything else to exist. Whenever I, whenever I was explained that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is Brahman. <laughs> I was thinking along those lines, oh my gosh. <laughs> so when I when I say objective truth, in terms of the three tiers that I, I've explained, subjective, objective, and there's absolute reality. I was in terms of Advaita Vedanta, I was think, I was talking about the absolute reality. But in terms of me and him talking, there's only subjective and objective truth. Objective being the absolute fact of whatever it may be. Like I even a point I was like, oh this pen, you know there's going to be a truth behind it whenever I show it to everyone you know everyone's going to say it's a pen but even he said no that could be subjectively false it's like okay fair enough it could be you know someone else could see it something else different but anyways the whole point is there's still an underlying truth let me know what you guys think about that one there's a lot of questions in this video it's, I hope it's a good one <laughs> but yeah it's a very interesting thing just the fact that even without thinking of Advaita Vedanta I came to a conclusion that there's an underlying objective or absolute reality called existence. And what I was using for existence is, is that something must create this reality. Something must, how do I say, an existence, existence must exist for anything to exist. That's really weird to say, but that's kind of the, the mental thinking I had. S existence must exist for anything to exist. Because without existence, nothing exists. <laughs> it makes logical sense, but it's just so weird and so like, duh, you're just, re you're just going in a circle there saying, existence causes existence, therefore existence. Like, <laughs> I don't know, it just worked though. Uh, anyways, let me know what you guys think about, I guess, all of it and the questions that I had or the statements that I had in this video, like about the 84, you're born, re, just say the world, the universe is recreated 84 times and you were reborn 84 times, not hundreds of thousands of times. Or maybe if, if the world has been, the universe has been destroyed and created hundreds of thousands of times, then you'd be created, you'd be reborn that many times and not more. I wonder if anyone's thought about that. I'm sure someone has to have, right? Anyway, this is my reaction to Finding God Without Fate, a personal reflection based on Advaita Vedanta from Swami Taratmadanda. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.